New York City. <laughs> it is beautiful and a tough place to live in. Um, it's very exciting and very stressful also. Um, I, I, I also feel at home here. Um, it's probably the first time I felt at home in America was when I moved to New York City because it's very welcoming. As much as there's so many people and it's very different people and it's loud and noisy and all this you know, chaos around you, it's such a welcoming place also and I am um, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I dream about living it sometimes, but I really love it here. There's this old Frank Sinatra song, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And somehow you seem to symbolize that <laughs> song. You came to New York, you just published uh, your first novel, which has great reviews. Um, so, is it the place where you can make it, New York? <laughs> I don't know if I, what I think of the whole idea of making it. I think every day you wake up and you do your best. But yes, it is, um, I think Francis Natura was trying to say that like, it is as tough a place as you can make it as anywhere. You know, I'm sure other cities have their own challenges, but New York City, you know, it's very expensive, <laughs> especially for artists. You know, it's very hard, you know, to get by if you don't make a lot of money. And, and I've seen what it's like to, to, um, to struggle, you know, to get by in New York City. Um, but, but it's also a place where it can be hard to get to, to stay in, even if you don't have money, because there's so much for you to enjoy that you don't need money. You know, we're in, we're in Central Park right now, and you don't need money to come to Central Park and like, look how beautiful it is. And, and in the summer, there's all these free concerts, and there's all these great museums that you can go to and don't pay a lot of money. So um, it, 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 I think it nourishes a lot of artist spirit, even though it's hard for you to pay your bills sometimes. Um, but I, 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 I for me, it inspires me, you know, like it's worth me to stay here even when I didn't have money to pay my bills because it inspires me. Like my story is very much based, my novel is very much based on, on New York City. It's a very New York novel as far as the fact that the characters live in New York, you know. One of them lives, one family lives in the Upper East Side, the other family lives in Harlem. And it's, you know, and it's, it was inspired by things I saw in New York City. So um, I, I can almost not separate my story from New York City because I think you know the story was very much inspired by this city. I was born um, in a village in Cameroon, um, it's about, you know maybe 40 minutes drive from um, the town of Limbe which is my hometown and it's also the town where the characters in the novel, the immigrant characters come from. Um, and, I, and I spent a lot of my childhood in Limbe. And then after college, I mean, after high school, I, I moved to America to go to college. I, um, I went to Rodgers in New Jersey. And then I moved to New York City. I went to graduate school here. And then after that, I, um, I got a job working for a media company. And then I lost that job. <laughs> and that was um, how I came about to write this novel because I lost my job and I had a hard time finding a new job. And I started writing this novel. So there are similarities between your life and the novel, but of course the novel is not the mirror of... <laughs> no, it's not. It, but there are similarities, because I am from this town, you know, and, and the characters came to America without having a true sense of what it was like, you know. Um, living in America, the challenges of being, you know, black and being working class in America, they didn't really understand that, and I didn't either, you know. I, I think my idea of America was very much shaped on... Um, on things I'd seen on TV. So I didn't really know the realities of what it's like, you know, to be poor in this country, you know. So um, that, that, that is my similarity with these characters. I'm, I'm an immigrant just like them. I'm a citizen now, but I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. So I am, um, I, I, and then I lost my job in the recession and this novel is about people struggling to get by in the recession also. So I share those similarities with them. Tell me about your relationship to literature and books. Has it always been there? Is that something you already had where, kind of, uh, where you were born? Uh, or was that something that you discovered over here, kind of going to college? Yeah, no, I always, um, 
probably about the age of eight years old, I discovered books. I was living in a house where there were a lot of books. And I loved books. When I discovered it, I thought, oh my God, look at these things that can take me far away. And I mean, we studied books in school, but I discovered like, you know, Shakespeare and Dickens. And I read, you know, I don't know, Jekyll and Hyde and a lot of African writers like Ngugi Wationgo or Ayikwe Ama. And I, books were just very sacred to me. They were these really special things that took you to other worlds. And I spent a lot of my time reading. I mean, my friends from back home or my relatives will say, you always were reading. Of course, you're going to write a book because you always love books. But I never thought I would write a book. <laughs> I thought, OK, books are meant to be read. You know, I never saw myself writing it until I came to America. And then I read one book that made me go, wow. <laughs> I want to write something. I want to try. I want to experience this joy of writing I want to see what it's like you know the other on one side is reading the other side is writing I want to experience that and that is how I came about to start writing the world of books was that a world of dreams um I suppose in a way um because I, I mean I never really you know wanted to escape you know through these books per se but it taught me a lot you know about other people and a lot of you know people's lives that I've never considered and, and you know and their inner lives and what it's like to be this person that person and one of my favorite you know um, you know plays growing up was Shakespeare's you know um, the merchant of Venice and I wanted to be like Portia when I grew up I thought wow what is it like to be this strong tough woman I want to be like this someday uh, so it was it was this fascination with you know a way of being other ways of living that I that you know you know really um, really made me very curious about the world and other people and other places. When you came to the United States, I believe it was in 1998? Yes. <laughs> when you came to the United States and here to New York, mm. did it live up to your expectations or dream? Mm. Was it a, an open country, a closed country? What mm. kind of culture did you meet? Um, it was... <laughs> it was a place where the life was more complex than the life in my hometown. I had grown, grown up in a town where, you know, I thought we had a very simple life. We, there wasn't a lot of, there was people didn't have a lot, but there was a sense that, okay, you just get by with what you have and you have family and friends and there was community. In America, the one thing that surprised me was how, um, how difficult it was to hold your life together. At least the people I met when I first came here, um, they, they had a lot of bills. <laughs> I remember when I first came, I, I um, I went to somebody's house and they had this, you know, stack of letters and I said, oh my God, you have so many letters. And he said, it's not letters, it's bills, you know. <laughs> it was all these student loans and mortgages and credit card and all these bills. And I never considered, like, this is what it takes, you know, to, to have that life that I see on TV in Cameroon, what I used to see growing up, this is what it took. Um, but the Americans also fascinated me because from the day I came, I noticed how much opportunity there was here. And, and while I don't believe that, you know, everybody works hard and they get these opportunities and they get to have this American dream, I do think that the country has tremendous amount of opportunity, which is why you see people st waiting in line at the embassy to come to America, that it provides so much, you know, to, to people like myself who um, wouldn't otherwise have had certain kind of opportunities in the countries in which we're growing up, that there's so much here for us, but it's still very challenging. Right now in the, in the election campaign, there's a lot of fuss about immigration. Um, did you meet that kind of barriers and walls at the time? No, I wouldn't say so. I think it was a much um, open country when I first came here. I, I found Americans to be very welcoming. But this was before 9-11, right? This was before the recession. This was before people started going, oh my God, are immigrants taking away my job? So, it was, a, it was a much simpler time, you know, and, and it happens everywhere, you know, times change and people change with it. I still think that it's a, it's a welcoming country, but, you know, there is quite a bit of anti-immigrant rhetoric out there. And it's, um, I, I think for me it's sad because I, I know many immigrants and they come here with good hearts to contribute something and to have a better life. And I don't think that that, that sentiment is necessary. novel uh, takes up a lot of 
questions circling around this theme of immigration. You have on the one hand the immigration family that looks out for papers to be able to stay here. On the other hand you have the other end of the uh, societal spectrum. You have the very rich. Tell me about kind of the basic structure and idea of your novel. Yeah, yeah I am. Um, <laughs> you know it, it, I was walking down the street one day. I wasn't thinking anything. I'm minding my business walking down the street and then I see the chauffeurs and then I saw the, the executives and I thought, wow, what is it like? You know, there's two very different worlds, you know, working class immigrant, rich, you know, executive on the Upper East Side. What is it like when they come together? And that was it. You know, it was a very basic idea. Um, but I started writing it and I started moving into their families and their wives and their children. Um, I was very fascinated by both sides. I was very fascinated by this Wall Street executive, you know, what is his struggles? And his wife, who is a socialite, what is her struggles? Because I know the other immigrant side more. I know what it's like to be an immigrant in New York City because I've been an immigrant in New York City. I am an immigrant in New York City. Uh, but you know, I, 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 I wanted to explore, you know, the ways in which um, the same situation, the recession, how it affected them and how, um, and, and how they each, you know, there's a lot of tension between the families at certain points and how, you know, they have powers over each other and how they use that power over each other and within their marriages, how they use their power within, um, within their marriages and also their dreams because they each have dreams, right? The, the working class immigrant family has these dreams of this American life, this American dream life and they, the rich family has this, you know, really good life on paper. They have nice house, they have summer vacation home and their dream is to see their children grow up happy and successful and every family is you know trying in their own way and then they clash and then things fall apart in certain ways so it's you know it's for me, for me it was a story about people each with their own dreams and doing the best that they can and making poor choices but that at the end they all wanted simple things which is happiness you know it's very much about i just want to be happy and i'm trying to do all this people with the same dreams but also people with the same fears yes exactly exactly and and like the wife in the african immigrant family and the wife in the you know the the, the wealthy family they both have dreams of like giving their children this wonderful life and and they want to keep their families together and they make choices along those lines and they, ha they have this fear of like you know things falling apart for them so um, why do i keep on saying things falling apart <laughs> but uh, but yeah so it's um the, the, like, they're all humans, right? They're all humans. I think that for me, what I learned is that behind all this, behind the money, the race, the class, everything, you know, the cultures, that these are just human beings and that many of us, we're going after the same things in different ways. So in a way, it's, it's a black and white novel because it's, it's a black family right. from Africa and it's a white family from, from New York. It's, right. it's rich and poor, right. but it's not black, in, black and white it's not black and white in the sense that you're judgmental. It's right. not kind of the bad white right. and the, the good black right. family as you might have expected right. in no. a bad novel. <laughs> no, no. This is, if you're looking for a novel about the wonderful immigrants and the awful white people, this is not the novel, you know. <laughs> in this novel, the African immigrants do awful things and the rich white people do nice things, you know. The people are complex like that. We all flawed, you know. Maybe there's somebody out there who is perfect. I don't know them, you know. <laughs> I think that even the, the Wall Street executive, you know, we call them fat cats, right? It's a fat cat, he, you know, the responsible for a lot of, you know, things, the inequality in America. This man still has his own virtues. He has things about him that you can admire. He works hard for his family. You might not like the way he does it, but you can admire that this is a father who wants to give his family the best. And just like the African immigrant family. So I think that that I, I wasn't out to say, oh, the African immigrants, look at them, they're so wonderful, and this poor them, and the rich white people are doing this. No, I, I, I'm not, <laughs> I, don't, I'm not, I don't think that is the life I see around me. I think I see the life where even people that I don't like sometimes, they have good parts to them. Is there a moral in the novel? No, I don't think it's a moralizing tale. I mean, it's not my place to, um, to say this novel is about this. I think it's up to the reader. I think that any work of art it should be interpreted by the person who is reading it or looking at it or listening to it and and that is um, as as a writer i have my own interpretation you know sometimes i interpret it this way other times that way uh, but it's 
you know, I'm learning a lot about the novel myself from other readers. You know, people say, oh, this novel is about this and this novel. And I say, oh my God, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. But um, it, it is up, you know, it is up for the reader to interpret it whichever way it works for them. Like I said, you know, you, if you're anti-immigration, you can say, oh, this novel supports my argument. If you're for immigration, you can say, oh, this novel supports my argument. It can be used anyway. It is a story and you should use the story to what, <laughs> whichever way benefits you the best. So where does it leave us? Where? What kind of a picture of the United States or New York in 2016, mm. 17 are we left behind with? Because on the one hand, we have a novel and there are things are complicated. Right. And, uh, and here you are <laughs> uh, in the middle of New York and you've made it, you've got your papers, you're an American citizen today. Right. You're the success story. So where does it leave us behind? I, I don't know, Mark. I don't. Um, I don't buy that whole idea of success story. I mean, what is that? What is that? You know, you wake up every day and you do your best. I mean, today I'm standing here. I don't know where I'll be tomorrow, but I'll do my best. I think that America has given me this great opportunity. You know, my, my agent and my publisher, they gave me an opportunity. But the truth is that I wrote a novel about challenges. <laughs> about challenges like myself, uh, about by people, uh, people like myself are going through. And if people, if the novel you know was published it doesn't take away the challenges it doesn't take away the reality that there is inequality there's racism there's sexism it doesn't take away that i am still a black woman you know standing here and i'll go out there and i still deal with the challenges of being a black woman and i know what it's like to be working class so i don't think we should use one story and say oh look at this it happened it's true it happened i am very grateful i am very grateful it's a privilege um, but i think that 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 the reality of what it's like, you know, to be working class in this country and to be black in this country, like which my novel in many ways, you know, talks about, is, is, is still there. It's still there. Whether or not I publish a novel, is still there. So is that what literature can do? It can open the door into a world which we in Europe or anywhere else right. might not know? Yeah, and that is what literature has done for me in many ways. You know, I, I have read, you know, I just came from reading the book by Lily King called Euphoria, which is about anthropologists. I never really thought about anthropologists a lot <laughs> until I read that book. And now there's this whole world. And, and, I, and I, I went into this village in, you know, New Guinea, and I stayed in this village, and I went into the mind of an anthropologist. And I think that um, that is what books have done for me. And, and, and people say to me, I have immigrants say to me, this is my story, you know, like it was so, um, such a reassurance to see other people going, feeling the shame, because there's a lot of shame, you know, about this not achieving the American dream. It's like you come here, you work hard, you have this American dream life, and if it doesn't happen to you, or maybe you didn't work hard enough, maybe you're not smart enough, which is not really true, because yes, many people achieve it, and yes, it, it, is, it is there, but there are barriers to achieving it for many other people, and I think that this shame that you didn't achieve it, like, it's not necessary, because, you know, I, I think that you, you can work hard, and it doesn't happen, and you do your best, you do your best, so for me, I me reading the book as a reader, because now I'm no longer <laughs> writing it, all I can do is reading, that I, I, through these characters, I, I experience the fact that some dreams might not come true. I had my own dreams that didn't come true, which is why I'm standing here. I wanted to be a college professor. That didn't happen. That's a dream that didn't come true, and now I'm here, <laughs> you know? So, I, and then I accept it, and I go in the other direction. And, and I think that that is the lesson for me, that, I, uh, that you, some dreams don't come true, and you, you carry on, and you find another road but you have to stick to your dreams, behold yes. the dream. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it's very much about dreams, which is a very American idea, at least I think, these dreams. I mean, when I was growing up, I didn't, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on dreams, you know. When I came to America, I was, oh, dream big, go after your dreams, your dreams will come true. And I was very fascinated. And, 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 uh, and I can't say I, I'm a big dreamer, like, oh, I dream these big dreams, but I do, you know, I, I'm fascinated by the idea of people have going after their dreams, which is probably why I wrote a novel about people who had dreams and what happened to those dreams. In Europe, we often uh, go to our writers and intellectuals to seek advice. If the nation goes to war, for example, right. we 
go and want to get moral advice. Maybe advice is, is a too big thing to ask, but the Washington Post wrote about your novel. If there's one novel Donald Trump should read, <laughs> it should be this one. Um, is there a wish or an advice you have to the society behind you, to New York, to America? You said in 1998 when you came, it was much more open and optimistic. Mm -hmm. Are we left, if you would have an advice or a wish for the American society mm -hmm. today? Um, well, I think that as far as the immigration issue is, I think that there should be more empathy um, in, the, in the conversation. At least that is the lesson I learned in writing this book. Because I did not approach this book, you know, understanding what it was like to be a rich white person living on the Upper East Side. Right? I did not understand that and, and I judged them, right? Because I did not know them and I thought, oh, these rich people, they're not the best people in the world. But through writing the book, I got to learn them that these are human beings too and that they have their own struggles. So I think that if we can start looking at each other and saying, yes, you know, maybe these immigrants, you know, are not my favorite people in the world because I feel like they're taking away my job. But who are they? Who are they? What is their story? How did they get here? What do they want? And, you know, and you seeing them as human beings, I think that goes a long way. And not only in the immigration situation, I think in many things in life that, you know, for me, I've learned that, you know, taking away my, you know, my, my, my prejudice, you know, and looking at people and seeing, even if I don't like them, and seeing that these are just humans, I think that, um, that allows me to, 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 to respect and understand their situation. So instead of talking about immigrants as numbers, right. every single immigrant has a story behind. Everybody has a story, yes. And, and, and this, you know, this generalization. Generalization, what is up with that? <laughs> what is up with that? You know, you don't know anything about somebody and you go, oh, I think they, they you know, they, we should, they rapists or they, I don't know, we should build walls to stop them. Yes, I can understand trying to protect your country, but this, blanket treatment of people, you know, people who are human beings, instead of just saying these people behind, this person with this story becomes 11 million people or 10,000 people. I think that for me that is what literature does. It says let's take away these numbers, you know, let's look at the people, let's look at the faces, the stories and, 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 and in many, you know, in, that is what art has given me the privilege and the joy of saying, forget about this big number. Let's look at one person or two people or 10 people. Let's look at them and their stories. And I think, and that, um, that we, could, we could use more of that in politics. Yeah. <laughs>